Hi, I'm Joe. I'm an alcoholic. All of us here at White Chip hope that you've been enjoying our audiobooks and AA speakers. You are welcome to join our Facebook group. Just click the link in the description and say hello. If you support the Alcoholic Anonymous cause, please hit the like and subscribe button. We upload new AA content every day, so if you want to see more, hit the notifications button. This way, you'll be the first to know we've uploaded a new video. Without further ado, let's listen to the next AA speaker. In the psychiatrist's chair, Anthony Hopkins talks to Dr. Anthony Clare. Philip Anthony Hopkins was born in Port Talbot on the 31st of December 1937. His father was a baker and he was an only child. Hopeless at school and good only at piano playing, on leaving school he applied for and won a scholarship to Cardiff College of Music and Drama where he spent two years. Later, after national service, he was accepted for RADA and graduated in 1963. He has since become a stage and screen actor of international repute. In 1987, he was awarded the CBE, and in 1988, Doctor of Letters at the University of Wales. Anthony Hopkins has been married twice, has one daughter, Abigail, and his most recent screen performance has been that of the homicidal psychiatrist, Dr. Hannibal Lecter, in The Silence of the Lambs. Tony Hopkins, why did you agree to, to this interview? I get a chance to talk about myself. I've always been, been a very self-obsessed person, as all actors are. I'm fascinated by the workings of the mind, and especially in my own place in the universe, and my own life development. Were you always self-obsessed? Yes, yes, ever since I went to school in about the age of four, and realized that I was on the wrong planet somehow. I, I simply didn't belong anywhere. Didn't understand any of the other children. Felt very alien and isolated. Principally because I was very, very slow and backward at school. I, it was double Dutch to me. I didn't know what they were talking about. I didn't know what I was doing there. And then I was aware that this caused a problem with my father a little because he was naturally very worried as I would be for my own daughter as any parent would be. My father tended to over worry. There would have been, what, reports coming back about how you were doing or not doing? Yes, and in my general listlessness as a child. Uh, I was very slow and uh, introverted. Didn't bother with other children. And um, I got this sense that there was something odd about me. My reaction to my own situation in life was one of deep introspection, although I didn't think I had the mental equipment to be introspective, and that stayed with me for many, many years, and it's only re in recent years that I've become much more, I suppose to use the word extrovert, or much more open, and certainly much more at peace with myself than I've ever been. That feeling of unworthiness or worthlessness has, I think, by and large, left me now. Did your parents have any ambition for you? Did they, did they see you as anything in particular as you were growing up? Well, I, I started playing piano when I was about five, six years of age. And I had a sort of talent for it. I don't think it was, a, I'm certainly not a skilled pianist now, although I play a lot. And I remember my mother's one moment of hope when I went off to piano practice, my first music lesson. And she had high hopes. My father was a cynic. My father had a favorite cartoon, which used to crease him up with laughter. It was a cartoon of an old magazine called Everybody's, and I, can, I remember it to this day. There was a photograph of a mother and a father sitting in a chair, and this little boy, very much like Lord Fauntleroy, with a little collar, you know, playing a violin, standing in the sort of playing a violin. And there were two thought clouds, two thought bubbles, and there was the mother thinking, the, her son playing the Albert Hall, and there was this father sitting there, with the son playing in the gutter years later. It made my father laugh so much because he was very realistic about life. But in a way, all that feedback, all that information I was getting, unsolicited, was making me feel that I was somehow special because I remember a rather crucial moment in my life when I was 16, going through all the pains of adolescence and suffering very badly at school from appalling academic reports. And 
wedding and the school holidays when the reports would come. And I was standing in the kitchen and they were in the other room and I, I think we were about to all have a row, the three of us, because my father was very worried. And I remember he said to my mother, he said, there's something wrong with this boy. And I blazed out and I said, one day I'll show you all. I am different, I am different and I'm going to be different. And I knew I had some kind of artistic, creative streak and I didn't know where it was. And I, remember, I said it with such blazing anger, like Jimmy Porter, you know. Mm. I said, one day I'll show you, one day I will prove that I'm not a misfit or that I'm not what you think I am. Were you a very passionate person as a, as a child and adolescent? I was very uh, bad-tempered, I was very emotional. I used to play the piano and I used to weep when I was playing the piano and I used to listen to music. Music had a tremendous effect on me. And I used to, like, I used to cry a lot, I used to weep and I used to get terribly moved and I'd live in this fantasy world and I'd go for long walks. Yeah, like girls. Didn't come into contact with girls until I went to college, kind of college musical mm. drama. Uh, and I was 17 then and I'd never spoken to a girl before, I was very shy. Mm. I was always a little wary, they very, very fearful of rejection. Mm. And uh, so I never could make a pass to go or ask her for a date or anything like that. Terribly nervous in that area. Was this sense of you being different, was it reinforced by your peers, your contemporaries, feeling you were different? treating you as different? Well, yes, uh, it was pretty obvious to me that I was different because the school teachers and the um, other kids, kids are boys, I don't know about girls, I know the boys are very, very cruel and very tough. And um, it built up a tremendous resentment in me because I was also bad at sport and athletics. So I always got that sense in my adolescent years, he's not worth much at all, you know, he's, he's a failure. And uh, that wasn't just um, something I projected that was a fact, that was a fact of my adolescent life. I heard those real voices from the outside, yeah. they weren't from inside me. And the funny thing is, they, they stayed with me for a long, 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 long time, until fairly recently, and um, they haunted me. And uh, I've longed all my life to do one thing, that, uh, that was to be a big hit in a big hit play or a hit movie or whatever, as childish as it sounds. And, I've, and this thing, Silence of the Lambs, has done it. And the oddest thing is that I feel now, well, that's that, I've done it. And uh, it's let me out of the cage in a way. Mm. It's freed me up. And it seems to come easy to me. I mean, the actual process of acting is very easy for me now. And I, my motto has become, I put, <laughs> put it on my script, no sweat, no big deal, mm. and expect nothing. And uh, for me, at the moment, it works. I was never interested in the Everest, you know, they all just talk grandly about the Everest of King Leo, the Everest of Hamlet and all that stuff. But I've realized now, I think, that I never really belonged in that world. I, know that I always felt alien in, this, in, in, in the world of acting because I couldn't actually convince myself that it was important. And I thought, well, there's something wrong. I must make myself feel that this is important. I must make myself do these parts, I must actually grasp hold of these things and do them, because if I don't, it means I'm not actually taking my life seriously. My, my life as an actor has been really a form of therapy, because I sense, looking back, that it's been uh, an opening of some Houdini locks to allow me to free myself of some uh, sort of unutterable burden, which seems to have finally fallen away from me. Why was it acting? Do you think acting was an accident? No, I don't think it was an accident as such. I was born in the same town as Richard Burton. And Burton had made it very big as an actor, you know. And he was a big star. And I was in my adolescent years then, and uh, I didn't know Burton. I met him once in New York. But of course he was a shining light in Wales. And I, I was trundling around with all my inadequacies and inner pain and loneliness and I yearned desperately to be something. I yearned to get out from where I was, not to escape a town or a piece of geography, nothing like that, but to escape some deep discontent in myself, so actually some deep dislike of myself. I just simply wanted to be very, very accomplished. Actually, I wanted to be very famous and that burned in me for years and years and years. You mentioned that the death of your father was some kind of 
watershed. Yes, he was a very powerful man. He was an extraordinary character. He was a workaholic. He, he was a baker and he worked very hard. He was born, he left school when he was 13, you know. And his father before him was a very strong, powerful man, passionate. My father's passion sometimes gave way to panic and despair. He, was, he had a sort of Willie Loman mm. complex about himself. He always believed that he would fail, you know, and things. But he was a remarkable man. And I loved him very much. And we were very close, in fact, sometimes too close. And we... How do you mean? Well, we... He was very proud of what I did as an actor, and he was very thrilled about it all, and I think somehow it unsettled him as well. Was he jealous? Maybe. Maybe there was maybe a resentment, and, you know, the resentment of age again over youth, or there was relative youth then. And when he was very ill in the last year, um, uh, I, you know, I, I was with him, and... Uh, but mind she was dying of heart disease, so he was a very depressed man, and he was very frightened. But we were close together in the end, and uh, when he died, I remember going to the hospital to see him. I'd never seen a dead person before, and there he was lying there. This was in 1981, and as I stood at the end of the bed, I thought, what an extraordinary process this is. I remember the doctor saying, he said, your father's just died. I thought, isn't this extraordinary? This great drama of life. And I'm not so hot either, because one day this is the way I'll go. And I suddenly thought that it's all a game. All of it seems to be a game. The whole of life is a game. Some peculiar playing out of something. Beyond anything I could, beyond my understanding. I thought it was like an acting out. I thought he was, now he's, act, he's acting dead now. This is some great force of life which is now playing dead. Playing possum. And he's played his game and he's off into some kind of other mm. state maybe. Who knows? But it was quite an eye opener. And some months later I felt very depressed and angry about something. I was back in California. Now I went to a friend of mine and I said, I feel so angry and depressed and I was in real, real anger, like I've never felt before. And this friend of mine suggested, he said, why don't you write your father a letter? I said, why? Write him a letter. He's dead. He said, write him a letter. I said, he's dead. He said, write him a letter. Who knows? You never know. So I did. I wrote him a letter and I said, uh, I know we had our differences, but um, I just want to say, you know, I miss you and I love you very much. I'm sorry we had our spats now and again, but we had a great time as well. Wherever you are, I hope you're at peace. That sounds terribly icky and sentimental. But a few days later, I had this tremendous inrush of energy. And I think it was accepting and seeing for the first time the meaning of mortality, the meaning of the finite nature of life. And I'd better get on with it and make up my mind to enjoy it. And from then on, it's 1982 that was, I have endeavoured to recreate myself, to reconstruct myself, because I have got so bored with being a melancholic Welshman. And from then on, I've been acting out, acting as if, I think it's William James' philosophy, mm. act as if you will become. And the oddest thing is that it, it has been working. Um, and I, I think I've got a handle on it over the last couple of years. Do you get a little melancholic? I, I get melancholic when I hear beautiful music. Yeah. But I, that's not, that's a sort of nostalgia. Mm. I no longer buy into the thing that if you're talented, you have to be miserable. I, that simplistic notion that you, you know, if you're talented or if you're creative, you've got to be somehow tortured. I don't believe that. I believe the freer one is from all that mental dross and awfulness. The freer one is to create. Now, whether one's work is better or not, it doesn't matter. Mm. Um, because I don't want to revert to that misery again. Because it's um, it's heavy baggage. And I've got a few friends. I tell the same thing. They say, oh, well, how do you do it? I say, well, act as if you're happy. If you're depressed, act as if this. What are you talking about? I say, well, I'm an actor, so I can act. So I can act and pretend that I'm something else. And the oddest thing is that it begin you begin to con yourself into becoming another person. Just sticking with that for a minute. Because, of course, there'll be patients and people listening to this who, who <laughs> are intrigued <laughs> and when you say you act it even though you're, you're not necessarily feeling just at that moment yeah and you act it what do you notice about people's responses do they change too they do they do i find that they do respond they they respond because they seem to want to be with me they seem to have fun around me because i don't want ever to go back to that moroseness again and I don't like being with people who are morose. How gloomy would you have got in the past? I mean did you ever get to the stage where you felt you just couldn't go on? 
Well, yes, I think because I had such a lustful life for some years ago, I nearly drank myself to death because life was constantly disappointing. And I think that's the problem with uh, drinkers, problem drinkers, uh, yes. alcoholics. Why did you drink? So I was not alcoholic. Alcoholic for you? Well, it, it, uh, drinking booze is very attractive and it's terrific stuff if you can handle it. I'm married to a woman who can, mm. has a glass of sherry every night and, you know, <laughs> much, and that's fine for her. And uh, millions upon millions of normal people can actually do it. I can't. I guess it's a sort of poison, I don't know what it is, but I can't have one. Because uh, uh, that inescapable feeling is not enough for me. I've got to have more and more and more. And did it do something for you? Oh yes, those uh, for those, the first hit was terrific. You know that you get the first scotch or the first beer. And what uh, did it do? Well, it just made, it changed my environment around me. It made me feel at ease. It made me feel like Humphrey Bogart or John Wayne or most of you. But it made me feel as if I belonged. You know, I always felt out of sorts ever since I was a little kid. And so I, I remember when, you know, I, my first time I started drinking that wonderful feeling. When you just, when you, you, it hits the center and you think, ah. I also remember seeing Sinatra on stage in uh, Las Vegas. I remember he brought him, he had a scotch. And he, as he drank it, he went, ah. Yes. And the whole audience went, ah, oh, but when I had given up the drink by then. But I, I remember thinking, I know that feeling. I know that when you go, God, this is fantastic. Now, if you can do that, and uh, like many normal people can, they can have that drink, they say, oh, this is terrific. But I couldn't do that. I had to have more of that deep level of belonging. But of course, what happens then, there's a sting in the tail, and I, I became addicted to it, so I couldn't stop. I had to have more and more and more, um, which is a common addiction, and um, finally kills you. Because I couldn't get enough. There was not enough booze in the world to satisfy me or put me at peace. Do you have any idea why you stopped? Because I was dying. Because I was going to go up. Because I was going nuts. But some do. Oh, yeah. As you know, you must have seen a few yourself. Oh, yeah, I've seen I But you didn't. Seen to a few of your notes. Yes. It's a sort of cliche, really, that you find, that I hear in the arts, the artistic world, that you'll hear journalists or some actors, I'm afraid, or others say, well, you know, blogs, he, he gave up the booze, but he was never quite the same since. A, an equation, in other words, with creativity. Yes, I drank because I thought it would give me the edge. I thought it gave me that passion and violence and all that that was required of me. I thought, <laughs> I mistakenly thought it was required of me. And that without, without, and it, without it, I'd lose it. That uh, without it, I'd be nothing. But now, you see, whether what I've lost the edge or not is immaterial to me because at least I'm alive and while I'm kicking and I'm happy. Uh, whatever the quality of my work has deteriorated or improved, I don't know. I certainly function better as a human being. You know, I just get up in the morning instead of coming to and I go to sleep and night instead of passing out. Mm. I'd rather that and be a very dull actor. It's now beginning to sort of, the last couple of years, beginning to change perspective for me because now uh, acting is a sort of wonderfully paid hobby. You know, I'm not that interested in it as a kind of great achievement. And you mentioned at the outset that it's a, it's a, an activity for the self-obsessed. Acting? Yes. Yes, I suppose it is, really. I said once in some paper, I said, we're all actors of damaged goods. I suppose there's some truth in that. I'm not sure if it, I can apply to everyone, but I, I, you know, I certainly felt I was damaged goods. And you said something, I saw you quoted as saying something some years ago that you were genetically maladjusted. Genetically maladjusted. So you said some powerful things about yourself. Yes, those are the put downs. I yes. put down myself before anyone yes. could, you know, get the boot in first before anyone else can, which is a self defeating game, you know. Uh, hurt myself before they can, then that sort of disarms them, whoever they are. It's not, it's not a, a very profitable game to play with oneself. Was it your drinking, or what was it that, that broke up your first marriage? Yes, it was, um, you know, my first marriage was just, I was. I was drinking and I wasn't very pleasant and I think we were both a little little match together but we have this, uh, we produce this rather lovely daughter, Abigail, <coughs> and I saw her recently, um, she came back into my life about four or five years ago, so I had a quick crash course in growing up. Were you, looking back, a, a very difficult person to live with? I had my moments, I was very difficult, yes, I've been difficult to work with many times, very difficult very complicated and very unreasonable. I've hurt a few people, I've shouted and hollered at people. I've made amends as much as I can with a few people that I know. And my wife tells me I'm not as difficult to live with as I used to. How important in all of that was AA? Oh, it was the 
turning point of my life. It was the 180 degree job. I got into that in 1975. I'm breaking all the rules actually talking about AA, but uh, however, you've asked me, so I can tell you. It's an anonymous program, but it is the most amazing philosophy because it's taught me over the last 15 years to let go of my life. That my life is in fact none of my business. I mean, it sounds crazy. It's like living life back to front. But it's about surrender. Now, whether it's not a religious organization, but it is basically a philosophy. Though it has a notion of a higher power, some kind. Yes, and people can either take that as a, you know, a, a committee of other minds and other knowledge and more experience, and they can use that as a power greater than themselves, or they can talk about God. I don't know what that is. I, I know that something quite remarkable happened to me 15 years ago when I actually realized that I was beaten and that I was utterly powerless over my addiction. Where were you then? I was in Los Angeles. What happened? Well, I was just killing myself slowly and my wife had gone back to England to leave me to die, I guess, or sort myself out. This is your present wife? Yes. She had married you some years before? Yeah, about three or four years before. And I think she thought she'd had enough, really, and she just got out of the way for Christmas, 75, and came back to England. I think it was really to either let me make up my mind. She'd had enough. Yeah. She never nagged me, but she had it. She was exhausted. And I met my match in uh, Arizona. I'd driven all the way down then back in a sort of semi-blackout. Could have killed somebody. And there was a series of incidents that woke me up. I'd driven the car blacked out when I couldn't remember where I'd been. And it was one moment of enlightenment. I thought I could have killed somebody, and I haven't. It's a wonder I'm alive. And I phoned up AA. And, uh, Why did you come to do that? You just looked up the phone book? Yes, I looked up the phone book. And, uh, You'd heard of AA? Yes, I'd met, met a woman in New York who was in the play with me, and uh, I was really drinking myself <laughs> under the stage at the time. <laughs> and in fact, it was pretty awful. I mean, some nights they'd be on stage and they weren't sure what was going to happen, because I was constantly, you know, I didn't know. I was four paces behind everyone else, and I was playing the lead. It was not the best way to be. And uh, they were very tolerant, and this woman who was in the play, and uh, she, her name is Mary, and she's an alcoholic, and she's an AA. And uh, she never interfered with my drinking, but I did ask her for a bit of advice, and she told me about the organization. But I didn't want to know any more. I thought, well, I'll do it on my own, and I did successfully for six weeks stop. And at the end of six weeks, I thought, well, what's the big deal? You know, I've stopped drinking, so obviously I don't have a problem. So I took that inevitable beer or tequila or whatever it was, and that was it. Because the issue thing. of a problem was was the usual thing. You, 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 couldn't, you couldn't face the notion of alcoholic. No, no, I was in denial. I mean, I was denying it all. That's the problem with it. You know, you, you're in, as they say, in denial. And that's what kills so many people. And of course, if you're functioning as I was, I was functioning as an actor very well. I was mm. making money. I was mm. getting on quite well. So I was in danger of being completely blind. And so many people do drink themselves into the grave because they are functioning. And uh, they don't see that the world is falling apart around them. And I was dangerously near that, but fortunately I was so scared when I went out to Los Angeles, I was so frightened by what was going on in my head, by the emotional and beginnings of physical pain I was in, aches and pains in my chest, and I was terrified of dying, and I thought I'm going to have a heart attack. I was a hypochondriac as well, but it was the pain in my head that was killing me, and there was, your time is up, Tony, you know, and I phoned up AA. And uh, something, the oddest thing happened, because I'd actually made that phone call, because I'd actually asked another human being, another person, for help or some advice. So I'd never asked anyone for advice before. Because I asked for something, I felt for the first time that I was becoming human. The most dramatic thing happened, I, uh, I was picked up that night and taken to a meeting. And I met an actor who I'd worked with a few months before. And he turned around and he said, oh, Tony, he said, we've been waiting for you. Because he knew I was one as well. And it was over. It was over. And uh, I realized I was in a room full of people who had felt all their lives, as I'd felt all my life, ever since I was a little kid, standing on the corner of the street with a hole blown through my gut, lonely and isolated. And I realized that my drinking was really a symptom of a severe kind of personality or personal disorder, emotional disorder. And my relief was that I didn't have to analyze it. I didn't have to go into endless psychoanalysis. The oddest thing happened is that I've never had a need to drink or a desire to drink. I've thought about it a few times, but I've never had a craving for it. 
No, did you have any withdrawal symptoms? When you no, stopped? not really. You stopped just like that. I thought I saw a few moths flying around, but that's about all. I wasn't quite good like Ray Milan and But I had the jumps. I, I was a bit twitchy. I had the phone ring and I jumped. Yeah. But it was a yeah. wonderful uh, time actually because um, I was so scared and I was so in awe of what was happening to me and what was ha going on inside my head. I mean, I started breathing again. I could smell things. I could see things. I could hear. And. AA, I mean, some, some say that one becomes dependent on it. It's, it becomes a, a major source of support, yeah. consolation. It's the mafia, really, because you don't get out and live. And you stay in touch with it. All the time, I go to about five meetings a week. Really? Oh, yeah. Wherever you are. Yeah, because it's the best deal in town. It's got free. I don't have to pay anything. It's given me my life back in tons. Uh, if I'm an addict of AA, so be it. But I went through a stage when I thought, maybe I need a guru. But, uh, smugly I say, I don't think I want that anymore. I've gone through that. Was there ever one? There was a man in Los Angeles called Chuck. I can't give his last name away, because he was uh, an alcoholic. And he was an extraordinary old man. His name was Chuck. Well, and uh, he used to speak a lot in a lot of meetings in California. And he was the man who influenced a lot of people like myself. And his whole philosophy was one of surrender. He had this wonderful voice and this wonderful laugh, great sense of humor. And uh, he would say things. He said, you know, my life is none of my goddamn business. And I thought, that guy's mad. He's got brain damage. But it has, over the years, it's made sense. What do you understand it to mean? That your life is exactly not exactly what it is. Well, I don't, I don't know what reasons I'm here. I mean, I've given up planning and I give up, I've given up projecting into the future. I live in a state of non-expectation. Give up expecting thing, everything of people, expecting everything of life. And life comes up with so many surprises. And I have a, a creed, I suppose you could call it, and I, it goes something like I, I say to myself, I mean, I don't say I think it in the morning when I get out of bed or when I'm going through the day. That is none of my business what people say of me or think of me. I am what I am and I do what I do because that's the way it is and we're not going anywhere. No sweat, no big deal. There's nothing to win, nothing to prove because of myself I'm absolutely nothing. Of myself I can do nothing. And that is a state of surrender, of giving it over to the very force of life itself. And the proof of the pudding is that my life has been pretty good for the last couple of years. You're not a conventionally religious person. No. No. But I do accept or acknowledge a mighty force, which is much bigger than myself. That is the very force of life. So I do, for the sake of argument and semantics, call it God. And I pay homage to this power, which is so colossal and beyond my understanding. Do roles that call on that turbulence, that issue of the dark side, do they attract you particularly? Yeah. You've played one or yes. two. I'm not sure any more than any other actor. Yeah. But you've played few, and I can think of several. And of course, the most recent one is really the most, most dramatic. dramatic. Well, who's the most attractive one to play? Parts like Lecter, I found absolutely fascinating, and uh, I find Lambert Larue fascinating. I'm, I have a beam in on those for some reason. I don't quite understand why. I am fascinated by monsters. Do you know why you're fascinated by them? I understand them for some reason. I don't understand the motives there, but I, I intuitively understood Lecter as soon as, you, as soon as I picked up the script. I knew him. I knew him so well. I knew how he looked. I knew how he moved. I knew his voice. I knew everything about him. But I don't mean I knew what motive. I just knew how to play him. I knew how to get into the skin of him. So leaving aside what he did, you knew how he expressed his feelings. Yes. I don't know why, but I know what scares. I mean, I found, I knew that that voice would scare people, because it scared me. I mean, I, mean, I, heard, I thought, oh yes, but so I thought that I can do that. I don't know what it was. There's something, something t darkly romantic about it as well. I mean, there's a, a, a line that I kept haunting me as an hour, happy catching Clary. And I had this vision of a man down the end of a la dark, long tunnel, and she's in there with a the little torchlight. And this voice comes out of the dark says, I'll hardly catch him, Clary. Like a sort of speaky awake mm -hmm. voice. And I find that disembodiedness so thrilling and strangely romantic. So I think that's what he was. He was a romantic dark angel to her, her guide. 
had a destructive fiend. It's a cannibalistic activity in some ways, actually. Well, actually, you, 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 yes, you, you, you chew up all these bits and pieces yeah. that are buried in your, in your subconscious. Yes. Well, I, I don't know what it's about, really. I mean, so he asked me the other day, he said, well, how do you prepare? I said, I, I just learned the lines and shop. I see, but I must do something more than that. And I said, well, about this Henry Wilcox, for example, I went, went for a makeup test when I was doing this thing for Howard's End, this part in Howard's End. And the makeup girl said immediately when Chrissy uh, beverage, she said, uh, now we've got a moustache here to wear, but you don't have to. I said, no, I don't think I want to. She said, would you like to try it on? Because I didn't know what I was going to do with this part. So I stuck this moustache, and I said, that's it. That's him. So the moustache played the part. I didn't do any work. I just learned the lines. It's, it's odd. It's an odd process. It's, um, I'm, I suppose I'm a rather externalized actor. I, I'm, I'm a, I suppose, a mask actor. I mean, I have to know what I look like. I have to know what I walk like as the character. Beyond that, I don't understand any of it. And I, which makes my life very easy as an actor. I mean, I try and keep it as light as possible. Even old Hannibal Lecter. I remember the first day filming that prison scene when Jodie Foster meets me. And, you know, I've, they've been filming about four weeks before in other scenes. And uh, I thought, well, this is it, you know. They didn't know this strange, limey actor coming over from England to play this part. We started the, the rehearsal, and the voice came out. And uh, they said, okay, let's shoot it. So we shot the first scene. Jonathan Demi said, yeah, that's great. Uh, let's do one more take. And uh, I thought, I wonder if this is working. And Demi said to the guy who's working on the props, so he said, okay, you can let him out now. <laughs> they opened the glass door and the man called the, uh, Billy came in. He was an electrician. He came in and said, what are you doing in my cell, Billy? And he backed out of the cell. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought, it works. <laughs> yes. And I, so I knew that I got the key of the character. Yeah. It's all a bag of tricks, really. There's nothing special about acting. There's no mystery, unless you want to make the mystery. But it's a, it's a bag of tricks. Given your philosophy now, you know, that your life is not your own business, do you then take it as it comes, or do you have plans? Do you make plans? Do you say there are things that you want to do before no. you die, for example? No. The yeah, extraordinary thing is, I feel paradoxically slightly sort of disappointed because I'd always wanted to do a film like, uh, let's say, a successful film like Silence of the Lambs to be in a sort of box office when I, you know, as they say in America. I always wanted that. Ten years ago, if it had happened, I'd know what would have happened. But I'd had some vague idea of what it would be, how it would affect my life and what I would behave like and what I would be. And now that this film has come along and there's a tremendous hit, it's all rather anticlimactic. I'm thrilled with it. I'm pleased. But I'm detached. It's like being a, I feel like a one-dimensional man. It's like nothing to do with me anymore. And it's, it's a relief. And I wish I could feel excited and jumping up and down. But I, the oddest things have happened. I start reading the trade figures of the box office. Not, I've, I haven't got a cut of it in anything, but I keep reading and think, oh my goodness, I made 122 million there. And I don't know why I'm pleased because I'm not getting a penny of that. But I think, that's not wonderful. I'm a 122 million dollar film. And it's fun. It's a lot of fun, that. And I went with a friend of, of mine called Terry. We went and drove in the car up to Leicester Square, uh, two nights after it opened. I looked up and I thought, there it is. How do you feel about that? I said, I don't know. It's very hot. <laughs> uh, Julie Foster, Anthony Hopkins. Doesn't make any sense, any of it. And I just smile. It makes me laugh. It makes me feel free. <laughs> Talking to Dr. Anthony Hare, produced by Michael Amber.